Hi there, welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. In this podcast, I interview successful business leaders and industry experts to help you grow a business. In this episode, my guest is Lisa Woodruff, a founder and a CEO of Organize365. She's been helping business leaders to achieve a life, a work-life balance. Um, she's the author of several bestseller books, including her latest organization is The Learnable Skills, a memoir of how I transform my life and reclaim my home in 365 days. In a business world, we always talk about production, performance, and productivity, and we assign quotas to these items and then provide staff training on how to achieve these quotas. But we never share uh, or focus on where it all starts from organizational skills. So Lisa shares strategies, how to reduce uh, you know, uh, overwhelmed, uh, clear mental clutter, and uh, develop organization skills, and uh, uh, live an organized and, and a productive life. I think you're really gonna enjoy my discussion with her when she uh, walk us through step-by-step process and also share a lot of tips and tricks on how to develop organization skills. So before we go, I wanna thank you for your support. We hit 700 subscribers last week on this channel. So please continue supporting this channel. Thank you for your feedback. Don't forget to send me uh, your comments. Until next time, please welcome my guest, Lisa Woodruff. Hi guys, welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. Today my guest is Lisa Woodruff. Lisa, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion, you know, um, organizing ourselves, whether it's business or a personal life, so important over the last few years. Um, so I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much for time today. Yeah, I'm super excited as well. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So if you can walk our audience to what is Organize 365 was about and, and how did you come up with the, you know, this idea that, you know, it's becoming more important? Yeah, so organization, like we value organized people. We looked up to organized people. We want to be an organized person. But how do you become someone who is organized? And as a former teacher and former stay-at-home mom, I observed a lot of people, a lot of families, just asked a lot of questions. I've lived 51 years, so I've done a lot of observing. And I realized that organization is something that is not discussed and is not taught. And we focus on decluttering and we focus on productivity. But in order to actually be productive, you have to be organized. And it is the skill of organization that is rarely focused on uh, that creates productive people. And so that's what I've been spending the last 12 years doing is how do we make the invisible work of organization that results in the visible work that you see of productivity? How do we get people to understand that? And how do we get people actually organized so they, they have more time and capacity to do what they're uniquely created to do? Yeah, that definitely is an invisible work that you know we don't realize and we don't plan for it, how to organize it as well, right? Because it's an invisible work. So what are some of the challenges you saw people dealing with, you know, whether it's in a, you know, business uh, environment or in a personal life, what are some of the challenges you see that, you know, people are going through? The first one is we feel like we should have it together. Like for some mm. reason, so everybody else has it together and we don't have it together. And we don't know where the store is, where you go by, get my together, you know? And so we try different tips and tricks that are surface level instead of getting to the root of actually figuring out what you need for this phase of life, for this season of life, for the work that you find yourself doing, what is truly the organizational habits that you need to put into place that then your productivity will run on. And you look at other people who are productive and you're like, oh, they set timers. So I'm going to start setting timers and that will solve my problem. Um, the timers are the habit that kick off a script in that productive person's life that they created that timer to remind them about what they want to do. So here's here's a really great example. Yeah. We go to meetings all the time, right? <laughs> Zoom meetings, in-person meetings, conferences, whatever. You see people coming in late to meetings and you see people walking in one to two minutes early. What's the difference in the person that's coming in one to two minutes early in the meeting than the person that's running late? You just see the timing of coming into meetings, but there are a lot of differences to those people. So the person who's coming in one to two minutes early also has remembered to go to the bathroom and they filled up their coffee or their water. And if they're really on their game, they even reviewed the agenda of the meeting they're about to go into. And so mm -hmm. not only are they showing up early, they actually aren't getting thirsty during the meeting or like, when is this meeting going to go? Because I need a bio break and they know what we're going to discuss. So they actually have ideas that they're going to bring to the table. 
Showing up late to the meeting, you also probably came right from another meeting, so you didn't go to the bathroom. You've yep. been dying for more coffee, but you didn't stop and do that either. And you have no idea what's going on in this meeting because you forgot to print out the agenda ahead of time, and you're hoping someone has an extra copy, or at least they're going to form some kind of an order. So there's a lot more to the behind the scenes of a productive person than what you actually just see on whether they're early or whether they're late. And those skills... The skill of showing up at every single meeting, having looked at the agenda and having taken care of your personal needs are habits that develop over years. Yeah, And that is the thing. We need to work on our habits, the small things we do every day that really make a huge difference down the road. That is such a great point. So you could be chasing a time or events all day, or you could be in a, on, on, on a, um, you know, a proactive way, you know, simply say, listen, okay, I need to drive this. I need to get a control on it. And you could be a lot more organized, right? But one thing you mentioned very, uh, very, uh, very interesting is that, you know, different phase of our life, we need to organize differently. You know, um, yeah. is, is that, is it, do you need a different skill set to organize as well? Or is it a, the same skill set? We just have to look at priorities differently, just organize differently because everybody's, going through different phases and phases in our life. And we need to organize it based on the what role we're playing at the moment to org- um, um, to what's in front of us. Yeah, I think there are certain building blocks that yeah. are that organized and productive people have, like morning, afternoon, evening res- routines, set times of day when they check their email, uh, set times per week, per month that they go through their personal financial bills. Like they have kind of solid habits in place, but... If you're in an active caregiving season with little kids at home under the age of five, if you don't do it when they're asleep or you're not at home, it's not getting done. Like it's like shoveling snow in a snowstorm. Like don't even bother picking up the toys because they're out before you're even done putting them away. So there are different things that work in different seasons. And once you become someone that observes your own life and are able to see the script that you're running for yourself, you're able to thoughtfully think through that script and rewrite it and change it in different seasons because you won't always be in the active caregiving season for little kids, but you may find yourself overnight in a caregiving season for your parents that you didn't expect. Or you may end up in a season where you don't have a lot of caregiving responsibilities and you know, you're an ideal weight and you've paid off your debt and you're like, man, I kind of have my stuff together here. I have extra capacity you can fritter away that time very easily. If you're mm-hmm. in a season where you're in a wide open road <laughs> straight yeah. ahead of you and you can be running like two careers simultaneously, you need to be even more productive in order to make that season last as long as possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you know, the, it the, all depends what you're going through in life. But do you find generally um, people who are not very organized in your personal life, they're also not very organized in professional life? Like you can't do one or another if you're going through a lot of challenges in your personal life, could you be organized in a, in a business environment or in a professional life, or are they both related to each other? You know, that is so interesting. I always thought you could only have one or the other, and I observed that people only had one or the other, and you hear women, especially when they're asked, like, how do you balance it all? Because men aren't usually asked that question. It's usually a woman question. And the woman will say, well, you can have it all. You just can't have it all, all at once. And I actually want to call BS on that because the more that I have thought about my thinking and put in better habits and structures, I actually am winning at life, at work and getting my PhD and being the wife and mother that I want to be like, I'm in a good open road where I don't Mm -hmm. have a lot of unexpected happening right now, but I'm able to do way more than I ever dreamt or imagined. But the difference is this. I don't just have a planning day where I think about this phase of my life and what I need in this season. I actually separate my household planning from my work planning. And so I plan my personal life and I plan my work life on a regular basis. So I plan quarterly for work and I plan every four months for home. So I do seven dedicated planning days per year to make sure that I have all the right habits in place for the season of life I'm in. And it is really working, but it's a lot of planning time. And that person who's showing up to the meeting on time, they're doing a lot of planning as well. Wow, very interesting. So I think, uh, you you know, habits is, as you mentioned, is one of the critical items. So how does somebody goes and start developing those habits? You definitely cannot develop all those habits in a one day. 
Uh, where yeah. does somebody start and, and uh, you know, how do they start developing these habits? Yeah, I think the first step is realizing that you have habits. Like you, you have habits and observe the habits that you already have and start to change one at a time. And the book, The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson, I love that book because it explains that your life is built on habits, but it takes decades for you to really see the fruit of those habits. So initially, as you change your habits, you won't see immediate results for yourself and for sure the people around you won't. But after you know a couple of years and for sure a decade, you'll be like, oh my goodness, that is the difference between the person I am today versus the person I was a decade ago. And so it's one habit per season. So you may say, okay, she mentioned morning routines. I don't have a good morning routine. I love to start there. It does not need to be this like 90 minute long drink the warm water with lemon type morning routine. I'm talking about Mm -hmm. you get out of bed and you show up at work. And between those times, you do things. Do you want to be doing what you're doing? And how can you take your decision making out of that routine and proactively pre-decide what you're going to do during that time. If you already have a good morning routine at home, then I encourage you to have a startup work routine in addition to that. You already have one. I know mine. I walk in, I get Mm -hmm. coffee, I walk around, I talk to people, I check my email. It takes 30 minutes. You do that too, but you just don't realize you're doing it. Do you want to be doing that? Is there anything new you want to add to that routine? Can you get two hours into your day and not have made a decision and know that the habit you have in place is supporting what you want to do for the rest of that day? So that's very interesting. You're saying to keep that decisions out of the routine. So routine is separate than decision. So you cannot. Okay, I see. So if I have to make a decision, part of the routine, that's what messes up because now I'm trying to decide what, what to do instead of just following a routine. Yes. And so now you are you only have so many decisions you can make a day. So you're deciding if you're going to wear the blue sweater or the black sweater, who cares? Just put a sweater on and get out the door. Like decide on Sunday night, like you're a kindergartner, pick up your clothes for the week. Look at the weather, look at the meetings you have planned, pick out your clothes for the week, hang them in that order. And don't think about your clothes again until Saturday. You will be amazed how much mental capacity and time you actually free up by picking out your clothes on Sunday night, like you did when you were in school. Got you. So so what you're saying is take a decision out of the way and then then you just follow the routine. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, 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 um, I went through a book, Atomic Habits. I'm not sure if you heard yes. of that book. Um, I started making some changes and, you know, and I find that that is just so um, powerful because um, I start my routine very, very early in the morning. Um, so I make a decision, all the decisions I need to make between six to seven because uh, that's how right after my gym time, right? All the decisions I made. So during the day, I don't make a decision, but I didn't realize that I'm, you know, I was just doing it just as part of uh, what I thought it was the right thing to do. But I think you made a, such a good point that if you take a decision out of it, it makes the whole day more enjoyable and easy to get through instead of uh, just mm-hmm. making decision every single um, minute in a day. Well, then as you're going through your workout and then you're showering and you're getting ready, like your mind is wandering on the task yeah. of the day, the meetings of the day, the people you're going to meet of the day versus like, okay, I'm getting out of the shower. Like, what am I going to wear today? Or if you're going through your regular work day and you don't have good habits where you have a timer that goes off five minutes before every meeting, go to the bathroom, get coffee, water, whatever you need, then you're thinking all day, when is the next time I'm going to be able to make coffee? When is the next time I'm going to get your coffee? Like that is not a productive thought. Yeah. It's a distracting thought, but it's an it's necessary. You need your water and your coffee. So pre-plan it in advance. The more you can script your life as if you were scripting it for a toddler, the more of your intellectual capacity you'll have for what you're uniquely created to do and not just the detritus of everyday life. Yeah. And plus, when you make those prompt to decision and how many times you make the wrong decision, just be making an emotional or impulse decisions. Right. So um, so if you're making a you know, thoughtful decision before that routine starts, you're definitely making a better decision instead of uh, making those those, uh, you know, emotional decision all day. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. So, so you mentioned something about the distractions. How does how big the distractions play a role in it? You know, definitely we, we plan over days when the distractions happen. Then, you know, there's so much distractions these days out there, you know, whether it's a social media or some news or, or all that stuff going on. And then we throw the routine out of the way because we want to follow up on uh, for whatever the distraction happens. So how do you handle those distractions that goes on all day? 
So one, you try to eliminate as much stimulus that is coming your way. Like I have very few apps, nothing dings or bongs on my phone. So when I do get in a flow, which, you know, it takes a while to get there, nothing is going to distract you from that until you distract yourself. And the second is, you know, we have such long to-do lists of things that we want to do, that we could do, that we should do, that we need to do. But the truth is you can only get one to three things done in a day in any meaningful way. And if you're saying, oh, but I do 10 things. Okay, but if you could only do three things tomorrow, you would choose bigger things to do than the 10 things that you're getting done today. There would be larger rocks. And so there are going to be 25 things that you do today, but you need to purposely plan at the end of the day, I want this one, two or three things done. So any time that you find any extra thought time that you have, you focus it in only on those one, two, or three things that you want done by the end of the day. And because you know at the end of the day, you want this presentation written, you want this recording done, when you find those pockets of time and you only have a couple of things that you're focused on, you will take that little time and put it towards the things that you're trying to accomplish instead of checking Instagram one more time, going and talking to that colleague, like until your schoolwork is done, it's not time to go talk to your friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, definitely, you know, uh, when you have a little bit of free time, you know, what, what do you give a time to? Uh, distractions, right? Um, yes. I'll check in all that so social media posts and all this stuff. So that is definitely play a big role. So are you a uh, proponent of creating a to-do list on every day or is it a weekly basis or, or setting up a goals? You know, what, what are your recommendation if somebody wants to organize what they're trying to achieve? How do you get the most out of the time? I've failed at to-do lists. Um, have you ever finished a to-do list? Um, I have a checklist in the, when I start a day and I try to accomplish as many checklists as I can. And I'm usually 90%, 80%. Sometimes I even go for a couple of days further, but I, I can, you know, bounce around the idea uh, all the time. Yeah, I never have. I, I actually did once when we were adopting our second child. I had everything done on my to-do list. And we think that that's what we want. Like we want to get to the end of this to-do list. And it's actually the worst place you could ever be. I was so Mm. bored. I was weeding a vegetable garden every single day. Can I just tell you, weeds don't really grow every single day. So you're like down at the, you're just trying to pull out weeds that don't even have roots yet because I didn't have a whole bunch of things to do. We actually do better when we have things to do. What we need is a priorities list. So I don't, I don't actually even have a to-do list. I just have these two boxes, which are my external brains. And whenever I have a thought, I write it on an index card. If it's a household related thought, it goes in the Sunday basket. If it's a work related thought, it goes in the Friday work box. As long as it can wait until Friday or Sunday, I don't think about it again. And then I process through all of my thoughts and my ideas, which allows me to continually only think about the one, two or three things that I need to do each day. And on Friday, I plan for my work week next week. And on Sunday, I review everything for the household and make sure that the household can make it till the next Saturday when I'm not working again. And when I plan for my work week, I really only plan my one, two or three things that I need to do on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, because by Thursday, we're in a whole new world. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. you have to leave some time for spontaneity. And the bummer of that is you're thinking, well, then I won't get it all done. Exactly. You're already not getting it all done. So I'm just popping the bubble early and saying, that's great that I have all these ideas, that my family has all these demands on me, that the business has so many possibilities. But in the next five days of work, I'm only going to be able to get done maybe 10 to 15 things, and I won't even be able to get all of those done. So because I can't get them all done, what are the few that I must get done before I review this again next Friday? And when you change the way that you do your work, From how much can I get done on the to-do list of things that I think need to be done to I only have five days, what needs to be done before the next Friday, what happens is some things never get done. They never were going to get done. Some things are so important that you're like, okay, well, this absolutely has to get done. So it'll be my Monday morning activity. And I'll actually think about it all weekend long. Or third, you hire it out, you delegate it, you you know what I mean? You make better decisions when you realize you don't have unlimited time and an unlimited uh, place to write down all of your to-dos. Very interesting. 
So the priority list you create, uh, uh, Lisa, I take it that's uh, that you, that's combination of personal items you got to get it done for the week and and the business and, and the whatever professional item is one list, right? No. So actually, this is what freed me up to be able to win at work and win at home was when I started making two completely separate lists. I had okay. tried having it all on one list for four decades. That didn't work. Awesome. In the last decade, I've divided it. Lisa, the homemaker, Lisa, the worker. And now when I, I can have an idea whenever I want, my brain does not filter. It's like, hey, I think that you should take the grandson to the park on Saturday. I'm like, great. I'm in a meeting right now. <laughs> like, I, yeah. and I have nowhere to put this information. So I just write it on an index card. I have index cards everywhere. So I externalize my thoughts and my brain immediately onto index cards. I print emails that come in that have actionables on it. I write down things my employees tell me. I write down things from text messages from my spouse. And I carry around like 20 index cards with things on them. And when I get home, I put anything that can wait until Sunday in the Sunday basket. And so I only focus on my household responsibilities on Saturday and Sunday. And I focus on my work responsibilities Monday through Friday with the caveat that I work half a day on Saturday on work. And of course, after work, or if I have a doctor's appointment, I have to take time out of my work week. So I don't act like a robot where I don't do household related things during the week or work things on the weekend, but I plan for, and I have the capacity for doing 90% work during the work week and 90% household on the weekend. So that when the unexpected happens on Wednesday night and it's household related, I can squeeze it in on Thursday and Friday if I need to, but I also could say I'll get to that Saturday morning and I actually will get to it Saturday morning because I only focus on that at that time. I see. So, so these two boxes of index cards that you create, they, they they stay there until the time comes when you schedule. So do you schedule the time separately in your calendar? Um, uh, when are you going to be uh, looking at the household stuff? When are you going to be working? So so. Uh, beside having those index boxes, then you have a calendar to um, uh, follow, I guess, right? So, so when are you going to be doing what what uh, work? Yes, and these boxes are like the size of a watermelon. So, like they're big See. boxes. One's a Friday mm -hmm. work box. One's a Sunday basket. They hold um, slash pockets. They'll hold items like pill bottles that need to be refilled, or you ran out of a spice. I just put the whole spice right into the box. So they they hold things and index cards, and absolutely. So Friday afternoon before the end of the work week. I mean, who does anything Friday afternoon anyway, right? So yeah. around three o'clock, I process through all of that and I plan my Monday. Now, when I do that, like at the time of this recording, we're recording this on a Friday, Monday, I'm meeting with two new CPAs and going to pick one. So if I did not look at my calendar until Monday morning, first of all, I'd be late because I have to go to Kentucky, which takes a while to get there from Cincinnati. And second of all, I need to print out my past two years of personal and corporate tax returns in order to take to that meeting. So you can see now on Friday, I'm looking at my Monday calendar going, oh, I need to be ready for Monday morning. I need to print things out. I need to put them in my car because I'm going to leave from home. You can see how planning on Friday afternoon really sets up your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to do better. Then on Saturday, I do all of my regular household related things, reconnect with my family. And on Sunday, I have a 90 minute time frame where I go through that Sunday basket, all the ideas I've had, I pay all the bills, I look at all the projects we're doing, I look at upcoming holidays, things like that, and make sure I have the cards I need, the gifts I need, all that invisible work that we don't really put anywhere. I have made it visible inside of this Sunday basket and give myself that time to get that organized. Very interesting. Okay, so so not only you planning that this week, but you know, by, by putting those cards in, you also looking at the next week as well. What do we have to get it done in next weekend? And you tackling the work before we start, um, you know, whether you have to make a decision or before you before you get there, whatever you got to do. Wow, very exactly. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about business leaders. You know, um, they have a lot of stuff going on. They have um, uh, teams to um, uh, manage. They definitely have to scale the company. They may have a lot of uh, unpredictable stuff comes more on their list than what they we plan for. So. How do, how do they go, uh, manage this and how do they go about it? Managing this is the work coming in the way that, you know, a lot of uh, um, um, emails coming in, a lot of, um, you know, the, the phone calls coming in and those are unpredictable work that definitely stop you doing all the creative work they want to really do to move the company forward. So how do you, what, what are your thoughts and how do you, uh, what's your experience been working with the business leaders? How do they manage this work? 
Yes. And I remember for years, I would spend, you know, three or four hours on Sunday night preparing for the week. I now do that on Friday afternoons and on Saturdays because absolutely, like if you are a manager, your number one work is the people. Like as you become a manager or a business owner and your business grows, it grows beyond you doing the work to other people doing the work. Your customer is actually your employee's and your employees take care of the customers of the business. Like your job is people. And so you right. must be available. You must be prepared for the meetings. You must move the meetings forward and you need to hold people accountable and you need to encourage them. And there is a lot of unexpected. So your work needs to be movable. So when I plan out my week for the next week, I know the one, two or three things I need to get done every day. And I know if something happens in the company where a team member needs me, that my work will get done later and I will go home later or I will get up early in the next day and I will do it because your work is not necessarily going to get done nine to five Yeah, uh, because you need to be available to your team nine to five. Now, when the unexpected happens with your team member, this is a great time for you to reflect on. I always defer to it's my fault that we are in whatever situation we are in. Yeah. I did not prepare you. I do not have the right operations in my company for you. We don't have a process and procedure for this. I did something on social media or in sales that created an emergency in operations. We didn't think through the whole process before we launched the new thing. So I immediately think about what did I do that created whatever fire that we're now dealing with inside of the company? Yeah. We deal with the fire, but the secondary part is you need to take some time to think about how do we not have this exact fire again? What can we put in place so that this doesn't happen again? And the bigger you grow, the more you can pre proactively anticipate what the fires will be and put things into place. And my team members, because that's one of our values is proactive anticipation. So yeah. I'll be like, we're going to do blah, blah, blah. And they'll come in an hour later and they just say, proactively anticipating that you haven't thought about X, Y, Z. And I'm like, you're right. I totally didn't because that's operation and I'm not very good operation. I'm like, that's right. great. That's why I tell you these things in advance. So really relying on their strengths, but being available to them. Oh, very interesting. So one is leaders have to do that. Second thing is they have to also teach their teams to do the similar, you know, yeah. they, they have to manage their work as well. Yeah. So how do they go about, you know, definitely they have to learn the skill set to manage their workforce, uh, work, you know, plans and workplaces, and also teach their teams so they could be working on the same levels as leaders are working on. So what can they do to uh, uh, train their staff? So it all goes back to this idea of, you know, I was a kindergarten teacher and I have made a few school references and I understand that we are all workers, but we all were in school at one day. So you know that when you were at school, all you had to do is get on the school bus, your parents dropped you off or you walked to school. But once you got to school, there were a lot of structures in place that helped you be successful. You were only responsible for the learning. When you go into your place of work, and now we are workers, we have so many extra demands on our lives because we are caretakers and we have household responsibilities and we have personal interests that are outside of work. Additionally, inside of our job, even if you were you know, trained in college to do whatever you do, that's book knowledge. Now you're doing real life work. And in real life work, we usually measure whatever the initiative of the company is for the quarter. And mm -hmm. we measure that in numbers and we measure that in dollars or projects done. But that is only one of the four works that you do as a worker. There are four yeah. distinct things you do as a worker, and we only measure the product that you produce. But usually you only have 20 to 25% of your time available for that. But we as employers and managers think that you have all day for that because that's the project that we're doing. Yeah. The majority of your work is actually a secondary work, and that is whatever job you were hired to do. So let's say this month we're going to make widget A, but you are the um you are the operations person. You need to create a new aisle for widget A, source widget A, bring widget A in. But also while you're doing that, you need to maintain widgets one through 99 that you're yeah. already selling, already sourcing, already shipping. Are you see what I'm saying? Yeah. We forget that one to 99 you're already doing. We're only focused on widget A, which is brand new. And so that's up. usually- It's layering yeah. up on top of the work you already have. Yeah. So it's literally 30 to 50% of your time is the job you were doing before we came up with this brand new project idea. 
Yeah. Third, the meeting I mentioned earlier, you need to do this work in relation with other people. At a minimum, you're going to have one meeting with your person that you report to, but probably you have three to five meetings every week at least. And so that, again, is another 10, 15, 20% of your time that goes into communicating and working in collaboration. And then the final part of work, which employees don't get to do as much as managers and business owners do. However, when they do it, everything goes better is what I call pink work, which is proactively planning for the next quarter, thinking about things that are still in research and development, making iterations on what is working now for future productivity, time, and money saving in the future. So all four of those works are what every single person in business is doing, but we only focus on one, maybe two of those. Usually you focus on the new initiative and however many meetings are on your calendar because you see that on your calendar And you forget about your job description and you forget about thinking about how to make process improvements or what is coming in the next um, in the next time. So this idea of allowing your brain to have every single thought it wants to have whenever it wants to have them and then writing it down allows you to stay focused on the task at hand while capturing these great ideas for future process improvement, the thing you want to bring up at the meeting that you're going to be in tomorrow, the idea you have for the product while you're actually shipping out products one to 99, you have an idea now for product A, you're trying to keep it in your mind while you're getting through your whole day. Stop, write the idea down, keep get through your day, and then take that index card over to that next meeting. We need to be able to tangibly see our ideas and our work so that we remember and have better um, productivity. You remember I talked about in the beginning that we have decluttering is getting rid of what you don't need, or maybe I didn't mention this. Decluttering is getting rid of what you don't need. And productivity is what you see in people that are really uh, have it together. It's that organizing piece in the middle. Maybe you do it digitally. That's never been successful for me. That's why I write it down on index cards. Yeah, that's very interesting. What you mentioned, the four type of work, uh, uh, work that we do, uh, Alisa, but you know, we are so traditionally, not only we, we focus on a one kind of work, but we also only measure productivity for one kind of work as well. The other three you mentioned, we never, you know, get, you know, get to see the work as invisible work and we never get, we never measure productivity against it. And, you know, so definitely there, there's a lot of blurry lines that, that we got to figure out how, how, to, how to do that. So if you can measure that, you know, how much time people spending, definitely you look at different ways. So I think that that goes back to your to-do list. That's why I say you can only do one to three things in a day because the one to three things in a day that you're doing on your to-do list are the are what I call purple work, are the project work of whatever you're trying to get done in 90 days. The rest of your day is already full of meetings and email and your regular day-to-day job. You don't put that on a to-do list. That's something you just do. So you can only add on usually one The most is three, but usually it's one or two things that I'm able to do at the end of a day, which means you can only do five to 10 things a week. Do you see what I'm saying? And they're only 13 weeks in a month. And you really, as a manager, if you want your team to be happier and healthier, and you want to get more projects through your company, you need to focus on less. You need to focus on less projects. Because yeah. when you put too many projects on them, then your employees drop the work that was their job description work. So they go into an annual review and you and you ding them on not doing all this work. But they're like, but we got the project done. You see what I'm saying? Like you you can't have it all. And the quality of the work goes down as well, right? So yeah. when, when you're yeah. try, juggling one item with another one, there is not enough time. You're trying to squeeze. What are you going to do? You know, you, you're trying to figure out how you're going to keep it going. That also brings to the point, definitely with the, with the COVID where we just gone through for a few years, people working from home, Lisa, you know, uh, lines get blurry a little bit. You know, is it a personal, is it a work related? People working longer hours, you know, they definitely get to, you know, if they're working from home, you get, they get to pick whatever hours they want to work, but they, they work in, end up working longer hours because they're trying to compensate what the, the project list is coming down uh, from, from a management, right? So they try to compensate the, what they're sacrificing yeah. is their personal time uh, with their families. So how do they how do they uh, uh, make sure that the, if the lines not blurry they have, they have they draw you know clear distinction between those two and and focus on uh, uh, one item at a, at a time? Yeah, the two items that really sunk me when we were locked at home. The first one was I lost my commute, and I'm only ten minutes from my office, and I actually was working from home when we started the pandemic, so I was like, well, I didn't have a commute, but I did have a fake commute. 
At the end of every day, I went and I ran an errand and that fake commute allowed me to process back to home. So number one, commutes are very important. If you're working from home all the time, if it's you take the dog for a walk or you run an errand or you put something where you physically have to leave your house or your desk, that will help you make a transition. The yeah. second one is when you are trying to complete to-do lists, they are never ending. And because they are never ending, you always try to do one more thing. And that is why you never stop working. So I remember it was, again, during the pandemic, I was done with my work I had allocated for the day, but the to-do list obviously was not done. And mm -hmm. I had completed my housework for the day, but obviously the house is never perfect. And it was five o'clock at night and it was a Wednesday. And I remember saying to myself, am I allowed to go take a bath and do a puzzle at five o'clock at night? Wow. Like, am I allowed, are we allowed mm -hmm. to go read a book, go for a walk? Like if you have tickets to a concert, obviously you paid for that, but am I allowed to just arbitrarily at five o'clock go watch Netflix for the rest of the night, guilt-free when there's still work to be done on the to-do list? And I decided I was, and it's because I did not even have a to-do list. I had these two boxes. One was for household and one was for work. Everything in the household, one could wait till Sunday. Everything in the Friday, one could wait until Friday. It was Wednesday. I had gotten my three big projects done. I was allowed to stop working. So you're not giving oh. yourself permission to stop because you have a never ending to-do list. Yeah. You need to chunk the work. And when it finishes, we squeeze more items in a to-do yep. list every morning and, and the new right. list starts right. and then you go through the same, same, uh, you know, right. same drill again. Very interesting. So, so much to learn from you, Lisa. You know, uh, walk us through your audience. How did you get so interested in uh, organizing? You know, um, you, you mentioned a little bit of your background already. You know, you've gone through. So what? how, how did you start uh, looking into that? Listen, this is the area you want to focus on. You want to help our people with the, with the dealing with these challenges. Yeah. Um, I have always wanted to be a wife and mother. It was the only goal I ever had in my entire life. And so all I ever did was babysit. And then I got a teaching degree. And then we adopted our children. I was in heaven. And during all that time, I have observed, I'm from a very large Irish Catholic family, so lots of different households, lots of different generations. I'm just always kind of watching how households run. Who does the work? What's getting done? What about big families, little families? I'm also in a German family. So I'm like, they all have different idiosyncrasies. And then I was babysitting for doctors and how do those families work? And then I was a teacher. I had all these students. How are their home lives? I would do home visits. And I'm just very fascinated by how we spend our time at home and how we can self-actualize as individuals at home for our own unique purpose. And after I uh, quit my teaching job in my 40s, I started Organize 365 to help other fellow women of my age get their homes organized so that they could have more time. And along the way, I have identified all these types of work that we do at work. And there's invisible work being done everywhere. There's administration work that is done for teachers and they get judged on their teaching, but then they spend like 20 extra hours a week doing administrative work and there's no processes or procedures for that. And it's just put upon them and you just have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. At work, you get judged on your projects, but you don't get judged on all this additional work. And so you end up working extra hours. And you can't figure out why you can't get ahead. And again, at home. And um, after having helped over 100 people get organized in Cincinnati and thousands of people online, I started doing academic level research to really bring awareness to this work that we are doing. Do you realize without children, you're doing 28 hours of housework a week if you own a home that has a yard? It's wow. a lot of hours and that's not yeah. with childcare. Very interesting. That's that's a lot of so twenty eight hours a week. That's, a week. That's a I lot. know. I know. See, you're like <laughs> that's yeah. an, an old statistic. That's uh, planning your meals, grocery shopping, preparing your meals, cleaning them up, doing your laundry, cleaning your house. Like it adds up. I thought, oh, that's not the right number. So I had my husband and I do a time study one week, and ours was thirty five hours without wow. taking care of the children. And that's why you feel like you're never done working because you're never done working. And so my um, aim is to make visible this invisible work that we're doing at home, at work, et cetera, and then have us reduce the amount that we're doing entirely. Stop arguing about who's doing it. Let's just stop dusting the house and only do it every couple of weeks. So I'll leave you with this one story. We were locked down in COVID yeah. and um, I had someone cleaning my house at that time. I've cleaned houses and I've had my house cleaned. I was in a season we were having our house cleaned, which yeah. came to an abrupt halt. 
And I did, you know, the basics, but I forgot about dusting. Week seven of lockdown is when all of a sudden there was dust everywhere in my house. So if you are dusting your house any more often than every six weeks, you are over dusting. So I'm trying to find these pockets of things that we're doing out of habit just because we saw our parents do it or we think we're supposed to or somebody's coming to judge us. Nobody's nobody's yeah. coming to judge you. Do less so that you can at five o'clock on a Wednesday night, go for a walk, read a book, whatever yeah. you want to do. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's just a routine stuff, right? Sunday morning, we do this. Saturday night, we do this, right? So you just get into routine and you don't realize that maybe you're yeah. overdoing it, you know, instead of uh, you can do it every other week instead of doing every week. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Um, there's so much, to, you know, wisdom, so much to learn from you, Lisa. How do you help our business leaders? You know, definitely, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, you know, um, there's so much they can learn from you. Everybody, you know, I talk to, they, they need to organize a little better. This is the area where we're constantly working, constantly trying to improve because we only have uh, so many hours in a day, right? So we cannot squeeze more hours in, but we can get a better work out of it. Right. So and and uh, so how do how do people get help from you um, if they need to or reach out to you? So I'm a former teacher and my my way of teaching is through podcasts. What I love about podcasts is you can do your housework while you're listening to me. I've yeah. got over 500 episodes. But if you have iTunes and you search our channel, there's a channel specifically for just information on the work box, which will walk through these different four kinds of work. And if you're interested in that rabbit trail over to all the other things I've talked about, about getting your home and your life organized. So we can include a link below this, uh, the video to, to the podcast as well and to your website, your LinkedIn page. People can listen, they can learn from you. And definitely I would encourage all business leaders who are watching or listening, reach out to you for discussion. You know, I uh, you know, I learned so much from you, but I'm sure any business leader reach out to you. They're going to learn so much from you as well. Um, there's always, you know, as business leaders, we're always looking for, you know, what could we give it to our staff to do and, and how could we be- get better at more creative work? And I think that we have so much, uh, you know, knowledge, so, so many ideas, how do we get better? The indexing guide, I love that idea that you could you could put in a different box, you know, thinking through it, because otherwise we keep thinking through the same ideas over and over all week. The, what are we going to do Friday? What are we going to do Friday, right? But if you have a box, you're not thinking until Friday comes. Exactly. Very interesting. Good. So what, what is the best way people can reach out to you, Lisa, if they want to connect with you? Uh, messages on LinkedIn or just email our customer service. Everything is at organized365.com. And I'm organized365 on all social media except Lisa Woodruff on LinkedIn. Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you so much for time. I appreciate your time. You know, thank you so much for wisdom and all the all the details. And, uh, you know, and we'll record that, you know, uh, compile this video with all your links below the video and uh, and uh, look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much for time, Lisa. Thank you.